Well, uh, thank you so much for, for coming. Um, I was told there'll be a very mixed audience, some professional philosophers, some uh, non-academics, and so I, I'm going to try to gear my remarks so that there's a little bit for everyone. Uh, whether I succeed, I don't know. Um, some, what I have to say is loosely related to some work that I'm doing with a, a, a doctoral student at the University of Southern California, uh, Megan Fairchild. Um, some of it will uh, relate just to her work, some to joint work, some to uh, work with uh, other colleagues, some to their work. Uh, most of it will relate to things that Megan and I have discussed. The published version will look a little bit different to the talk, uh, but uh, I thought I'd just be upfront about the fact that perhaps uh, none of the ideas that I'll articulate will really be uh, my own. I'll just try and keep you amused for an hour, okay? Um, I will take my watch out. What I'd like to do is juxtapose three kinds of attitudes towards the branch of metaphysics that's called ontology. Ontology is the study of what there is. If you do ontology, you put forward views about what there is, and then you say something by way of defending those views. But I'm going to use what there is and what exists kind of interchangeably. If you think mountains exist, you're already an ontologist, okay? It's not like uh, there's uh, some particular point where you move from uh, ordinary discourse in the pub about what there is to ontology, uh, I see the transition as seamless uh, myself. So th as, as, an, as advertised, three broad attitudes within ontology that I'll call the adders, the subtractors, and the conservatives. Uh, the conservatives uh, take common sense more or less at face value. Uh, if common sense says there's a certain kind of thing, the conservative says there's a certain kind of thing of that sort. The conservative tends to add in some stuff from physics that maybe common sense didn't notice. Maybe common sense didn't know about fermions, but modern physics tells us about fermions, so the conservative's happy to throw fermions into the pot, as it were. Uh, but the conservative tends to stop there. The, uh, there are various wild and wonderful objects that have been countenanced by philosophers and in particular metaphysicians. The conservative says none of those. Okay? You've got the conservative. The adders believe in everything the conservatives believe in and a lot more. They believe in all sorts of wild and wonderful objects that aren't particularly the topic of common sense, uh, but they uh, think that a healthy perspective on reality is to recognize the objects of common sense and a vast plenitude of other objects as well. The subtractors go in the other direction. They repudiate many of the objects of common sense and institute their own favorite ontology in its place. Some of them uh, uh, are very much driven by uh, physics. They'll have believe in atoms, but not mountains. Some of them are driven by yet more by giddy kinds of metaphysics. Uh, there's just space-time, no matter, no mountains, no people. There are just minds, no mountains. No tables, just minds. Uh, these are all very different kinds of subtractors. In this talk, I'm going to give you a flavor of the debate between the conservative and the adder. Don't think that the map that I gave you, I mean, it's very vague for one thing, but it's not exhaustive either. There are certain kinds of characters that are to uh, these issues in ontology, what the agnostic is to fundamental issues in religion. There are some, on, some people that might say, well, I don't know if there are lots more things than, uh, 
uh, than the objects of common sense. I'm just not sure. Such a person isn't clearly a conservative, because the conservative says there aren't those extra things. They're not adders either, because the adder says there are those extra things. The, um, the, this agnostic, as it were, uh, shrugs his or her shoulders and goes on. So I don't pretend that, that my little map is um, uh, exhaustive, but I think it's nevertheless useful. Let me give you a bit of a feel for what sorts of things the conservatives buy into. I'm not going to talk too much about the physics end of things. And what sorts of things the planetude lovers, the adders, uh, buy into. So uh, the conservatives, they'll tend to um, buy into lumps of matter. Um, you know, there's that quantity of wood, there's that quantity of flesh, there's that quantity of uh, wallpaper, uh, and so on. So there are lumps of matter. But in addition, your typical kind of conservative will uh, admit objects that aren't quite the same as lumps of matter. If I fashion a lump of clay into a statue, the typical conservative, uh, and I think the conservative, such a conservative represents themselves as giving voice to how we, or the ordinary person thinks about things, will think that there's an extra thing, a statue that comes into existence. The statue isn't the same thing as the lump of clay because the lump of clay existed prior to the uh, artistic engagement, but the statue only existed posterior to the artistic engagement, and it seems as if, uh, given that the statue has one, uh, uh, one history and the lump of clay another, they can't be the same thing. So that's the sort of thing that the conservatives happy with. They're happy with statues and ships and mountains. Um, they, there are little in-house debates among conservatives. They won't all just quite in a very superficial way take common sense at face value. You know, uh, I might one day say, oh, there's a lack of cheese in the fridge. Uh, conservatives won't typically just in a knee-jerk way says, well, there's lax then, because ordinary people talk about lax. And if I say there's a surplus of bananas in Tesco's this week, you know, they typically won't just be willing to say, oh, there are these things, surpluses. As well as bananas, there are these other things, surpluses of bananas. And it's a slightly delicate matter to decide when to uh, discard some ordinary way of talking and when to take it at face value. And that's, uh, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why my characterization of the conservative is a, is a little bit vague. But they kind of have the attitude of buying into uh, common sense, more or less, maybe with a tiny bit of tweaking, buying into some physics, but not buying into very much more. Okay? And it's inevitably vague, my characterization. Uh, let me give you a feel for what, the ad, what stereotypical adders um, uh, will believe in. I mean, they'll believe in, say, this pair of glasses with the conservative. They'll believe in this person here with this, cons like the conservative. But they'll also believe in an object uh, typically, that is, they'll typically believe in an object that is composed out of these glasses and that person. We don't have a name for it. It's not very interesting to ordinary people, the thing composed out of these glasses and that person, but the adder thinks, yeah, uh, there is such a thing, even though we, it's not of interest to ordinary people and even though we don't have a name for it. There are lots of things we don't have names for. Um, getting even weirder on the spectrum. Um, suppose uh, I build a chair that's painted red. The, the uh, typical... Well, I don't know. There are some adders that think this way, as well as the chair. And of course, the chair is a thing that would continue to exist even if you repainted it green. 
there's another kind of thing, let's call it a red chair, okay? And red chairs are really different to chairs, because what happens with red chairs is if you paint them, that's it. That's like killing them. They go out of existence when you paint them. When you paint that chair green, the chair continues to exist. It's just undergone, undergone a change of color. The red chair has had something much more dramatic happen to it. It stopped existing. Okay. And the, this kind of, the kind of adder I have in mind um, will think, even if I don't ever change the color of the chair, uh, there are still those two things, the chair and the red chair, and why? Because there's one thing that would have existed even if I'd have painted it green, it would have carried on existing. But there's another thing there that would have been annihilated if I'd have painted it green. Well, if there's a thing that would have been annihilated if I'd have painted it green, and if there's a thing that wouldn't have been annihilated if I'd have painted it green, that seems to be a telltale sign of there being two things here. So at least one kind of adder is, uh, is, is liberal along that kind of dimension. And, you know, I just want to say, I don't think you should think the adder is in conflict with common sense, or that would need special argument, because it's not clear that common sense people have views about whether these things exist or not. Do common sense ordinary people have a view as to whether there's something composed out of these glasses and this person? Well, we'd need some argument. Uh, or some data or some evidence, if we're going to think common sense definitively repudiates that thing, more likely common sense hasn't entertained the question whether that's that thing. And of course, you could go up to people in the street and with, a, you know, uh, with a mic and ask them questions like that, but you know, arguably what they'll then start doing is just kind of knee-jerk you know, amateur philosophy rather than give voice to opinions that they had all along. So it's not clear at all. I don't think we should be thinking the conservative is the, the voice of common sense and the adder is the enemy of common sense because the conservative goes beyond common sense in adding that's all, okay, roughly. Okay, you get the picture? Okay, one recent work that I'll speak to a little bit is this book, Objects, Nothing Out of the Ordinary by Daniel Corman that I've just been reading uh, in the last week, um, that is a, is a defense of cons conservatism. And so what I want you to do is in part to um, give you a feel for how conservatives might try and argue against adders, in part talk about how adders might defend their view, and in part to give you a feel for some other kinds of surprising ways uh, that are less, much more out of the ordinary uh, that uh, people might try to put pressure on various adding perspectives. Without going into much detail yet, let me just add a few extra thoughts and caveats. Uh, one thing to, to realize is that the conservatives, in saying they're positing nothing out of the ordinary, they are often positing things that are extraordinary from the point of view of physics. They're not things that fall under ordinary physical laws. For example, uh, we're used to learning from physics that nothing travels faster than the speed of light, but I think the way many conservatives think is, you know, if I've got a restaurant in one building and then I do some legal stuff to make the restaurant move to another building, at the point at which uh, I sign the contract, the building didn't move, but the restaurant almost instantaneously moved from there to there. Similarly, if I sign, uh, if, if some uh, leaders sign a document that expands a country, then almost instantaneously the country has, has grown. It, it went from one size to maybe a much greater size without uh, at any point, uh, as it were, uh, occupying any of the intermediate positions. These, 
There are myri the objects of common sense travel faster than the speed of light. They're wild and wonderful objects from the point of view of physics. The sense in which they're nothing out of the ordinary is that we seem to countenance them in common sense and we seem to talk about them in ways that, that suggest that they can't be quite the same thing as the atoms and masses of matter and so on that are the fit subject of mathematical physics as we find it today. So just a little caveat about the um, conservative. How about just something to get, might give you a bit of a feel of uh, the adding position. I think what adders do is they like to think systematically and hope to have a theory of ontology that's built on simple and general principles. I mean, that's what we like in any field. If we're doing economics, we like uh, general principles that explain economic uh, phenomena. If we're doing mathematical physics, we like general principles that explain uh, and systematize the data. And if we're doing ontology, at least one thing that we might like is uh, general systematic principles that um, uh, uh, give you a nice, that, that, that explains some data and ran things out in a nice way. And I think what you'll tend to find if you read the adders, speaking at a certain level of abstraction here, they'll think if you're looking for a, an ontology that's built on nice, clean, systematic principles, then you better be an adder rather than a conservative. On the, on the heels of that, let me give you a flavor of the sorts of things that adders might say against the conservative. I hope you've got a, at least a bit of a feel for what the, an adder is and what a conservative is. Um, first thing, I think um, the adder tends to run, just, and this is straightforwardly connected to what I just said, is that the conservative tends to not have any nice general principles about what exists and what doesn't. I mean, let's suppose, following common sense, that the uh, adder, that the conservative believes in archipelagos, the system of Hawaiian Islands, for example, is an archipelago. A scattered, uh, a scattered collection of islands, they form an, this thing, an archipelago. That seems to be an object that common sense uh, welcomes and tolerates and talks about and gives names to. Juxtapose the archipelago that is the Hawaiian Islands with uh, the as it were, archipelago that consists of this person and those, these glasses. You should already get the feel. It's going to be, you're going to have your work cut out for you if you want to explain using neat principles why the, uh, that the archipelago of Hawaiian Islands exists. But there is no such thing that's, an, uh, as it were, an archipelago consisting of this person and these glasses. Or maybe, uh, as an intermediate thing, we could at least you know, start to think about the archipelago of spectacles in this room. Uh, that's not something that common sense talks about, but it's a bit cheesy if you think uh, that the archipelago of Hawaiian Islands exists, but there is no such thing as the archipelago of spectacles in this room. I mean, there doesn't seem to be anything very systematic or principled to say about why the one thing should be in being, but the other thing not. And so one, one thing that you tend to find, or I tend to find, and it's very explicit in, uh, in this book, is a sort of um, hostility to a metaphysics based on general principles. What you often find conservatives say is, I'm not looking for general principles. I'm just giving you my judgment call. There are, uh, there is maybe, an, the archipelago of the Hawaiian Islands, there isn't the, this thing, the archipelago of um, uh, 
spectacles in this room, and I don't have any general principles, but that's my judgment call. You ask me a question, I'm giving you my judgment call. And that's what goes on among a range of conservatives, including, um, uh, including Corman. I mean, sometimes they appeal to absurdity. Well, it's absurd to think that there's the archipelago of, of spectacles in this room. Um, but uh, they don't really uh, do much by way of uh, filling out their conservatism with general principles. Uh, the, the, the situation, in a way, resembles a debate within moral philosophy. Within moral philosophy, there are some characters that call themselves moral particularists, that think it's wrong to think of morality as somehow built on general principles. No, we, we're pretty good at spotting good actions and bad actions, but that ability isn't underwritten by some facility with ultimate general principles about what's good and what's bad. That's the wrong way to think about our ability to spot uh, what's good and what's bad. And I feel in a certain way uh, the conservative is an ontological analog of the, of the moral particularist. Sorry, I'm just... When did we start, just so I... Quarter two, okay. <laughs> One little thing, I mean, you haven't read this book, but I just want to quickly say, um, the uh, Corman characterizes the adder, or what he calls the permissive approach to metaphysics, as the view that there are sway, huge swathes of highly visible objects uh, right now in this room. But I think one should treat separately the issue of permissivism from certain delicate issues in the philosophy of perception. Suppose I believe in the chair and this other thing, the red chair, and this other thing, the, um, the cushion chair, where if you take away the cushion that annihilates it and so on. I mean, I think it's a further question, which of these things do I see right now? I mean, According to the permissivist, there are tons of things that are chair-shaped that are here right now. Which of those things do I see? I think that's an interesting question within the philosophy of perception for the permissivist. But I don't think we should take for granted the answer, you see each of them. Oh, I see zillions, and I'm attending to zillions of things right now, perceptually. That doesn't seem uh, at all clear. So uh, I would resist uh, entangling these ontological debates with some quite interesting questions and underexplored questions within the, the uh, philosophy of perception. Okay, so I start, let's articulate some complaints that the ADA directs against the conservative. One complaint I've just gone through is um, the lack of principle. I've got nice general principles, you're, you haven't got principles. I mean, that is, I, mean I, I, I haven't got lots of time, but that's one kind of complaint. Another kind of complaint um, is that the conservative is giving too much metaphysical authority to our ordinary sensibilities. I mean, let me give you an, a few examples. Um, suppose we grant, I mean, I think it's, it's quite a, that it, when I take a watch to the watchmaker and the watch, watchmaker, you know, pulls the bits apart, cleans them up, puts them back together, uh, I get my watch back. Okay. I think that's how we ordinarily think about things. I didn't get a new watch made out of the old bits. Uh, I got my watch back. Of course, it may, I mean, maybe if I smash Clayton to smithereens and then gather the atoms together and, you know, put them together in a Clayton-esque uh, configuration, I think common sense maybe uh, dithers there. But as far as the case of the watch goes, the way we ordinarily talk, is that we got a watch back. We can imagine a community of, 
not very alien people. And maybe, maybe let's say it's a community in Canada or Newfoundland uh, that we come across. You know, maybe a community that's been living in relative isolation. And they kind of have, you know, timepieces and so on. But we, we notice something strange. Uh, uh, when they take a watch to the watchmaker, here's the way they talk. I mean, if they anticipate it's going to have to be uh, disassembled, they say, you know, I know you're going to have to destroy my watch, but, you know, just I'll pick up the new watch next week and I hope that the new watch works, you know, <laughs> is, uh, works better than this. That isn't that. It's not hard at all to imagine that... Uh, these, uh, a community that talked that way. Uh, they conceptualized things that they were getting a new watch. Now, it seems kind of strange to give your own sensibilities such authority that you say, oh, well, I'm, they're confused. They're not realizing that they're getting the same thing back, and uh, they're just completely confused. Uh, I'm locking on to the real contours of reality and they're just confused. We can all feel a little bit of embarrassment making that speech. I mean, it seems kind of an accident that we go this way. It doesn't seem to give voice to anything very deep. Uh, and it seems uh, a, little bit, a little bit silly to give our contingent sensibilities that sort of metaphysical authority. If you're going to be a conservative but you don't want to give your sensibility is that kind of authority, the natural thing to do is to add. You say, oh, there's a guy, uh, the, the, there's a thing that tells time that goes out of existence when you disassemble, and the Newfoundlanders are talking about that guy. There's another thing that, uh, that uh, I mean, permanently goes out of existence. There's another thing that at worst temporarily goes out of existence when you disassemble. And we're talking about that guy. Uh, as it were, you can split the difference if you're an adder. But if you're a conservative, there's a severe risk that you'll come across as giving excessive uh, metaphysical authority to sensibilities that seem uh, kind of the result of happenstance and don't run, uh, don't run very deep. Just to give another example, I mean, um, suppose we grant that the way ordinary people think is that when the Titanic sank, that ship went out of existence. And what happened then is that we went in search of the wreckage of the ship. But the wreckage of the ship isn't the ship. The Titanic was no more. And what there was was the wreckage of a Titanic. Similarly, perhaps assuming we're materialist, non-religious people. If I shoot Amy, you know, then what we'll have on the floor is, as it were, the wreckage of Amy. It won't be, oh, there's Amy, she's dead, but, you know, that's the bad news, but she's still around, she's just in a slightly impoverished condition. Uh, let's grant that ordinary, ordinary people, uh, ordinary common sense thinks about the wreck of the Titanic as what's left over from a ship that has been annihilated, has stopped existing. Even when I tell the story, you realize it's not uh, very hard to uh, get into a slightly different frame of mind where you think, uh, no, the, uh, the Titanic still exists just in an impoverished state, under the sea, kind of uh, uh, in disarray, not seaworthy anymore, but the Titanic, we're actually visiting the Titanic. It's just not in seaworthy condition. And we can imagine Newfoundlanders that go diving thinking that they're going to see the Titanic, and we can imagine uh, uh, Cormanians diving thinking, well, they've got no hope of seeing the Titanic, but they will, of course, get to see the wreck of the Titanic. And again, I think it's very strange to put such faith in your contingent sensibilities to think that one of these communities is making a mistake. I mean, when I tell the story, even I might say too, one thing that it brings out is that actually is the vacillation even within common sense. We vacillate between various ways of talking. Sometimes we'll talk about 
the ship lying under the sea. Sometimes we'll talk about the ship being no more. There's that kind of vacillation. And if there's that kind of vacillation within common sense, it seems to not be very helpful to say, oh, I buy into the ships of common sense because there is no stable thing, as it were, the stable story about what are the ships of common sense. And I think similarly when you kill a cat and there's a corpse under the ground, sometimes we'll say, yeah, there's my cat, it's dead. Uh, my cat is uh, in a terrible state, it's dead, basically. Uh, sometimes we'll think as if our cat doesn't exist anymore and we've just got the body of the cat, we vacillate. I think it's a mistake to think that there's some uh, straightforward story about what are the objects of common sense, insofar as common sense vacillates and you want to be even-handed to the moods of common sense. Again, there's pressure to add in a whole bunch of things so that there's a long-lived thing that uh, is now under the ground and there's a shorter-lived thing that got annihilated by... Um, by... Uh, by... Uh, by death. <laughs> okay, so that's a second sort of way I'm trying to give you, and this is sort of a apologetics for adding, if you see what I mean. Um, um, some more, another kind of thing. If I do think if we do. I mean, if you ask me what's wrong with the conservative, I'm trying to be honest with you, what I'd say in part is just the conservative's weird. I mean, think by analogy about a semi-conservative. A semi-conservative comes along and says, I mean, this is a really weird view. There are tables, but there aren't chairs. Of course, there are little bits that are arranged in a chairish way, but they, there aren't these things. Chairs, there are just tables. That's my view. What are, you, what are the principles? Oh, I don't have any principles. That's just my view. Uh, it just strikes me that there are... That's really how the world strikes me. It strikes me that there are tables. I'm an ontological particularist. It strikes me there are tables. It doesn't strike me there are chairs. It just strikes me there are atoms arranged chair-wise, but they don't make up chairs. I mean, what am I supposed to say? The person isn't giving me principles. They're not even pretending to have principles. They're just saying how things strike them, uh, what am I supposed to say? I mean, I just think they're weirdos. That's what I think. Those are weirdos, and I can't, I mean, I might not even have any therapy for them, you know. I'll try, I'll try very, I mean, they're really in need of therapy. I can't just give them straightforward arguments. They didn't want principles, they didn't see, feel the need for principles. I can try various bits of therapy, and that's the best I can do. So I think... That's the feeling of the adder towards the, the, the conservative. You're telling me that the, the archipelago is there, but the archipelago of, of, of islands is there, but there is no such thing as the archipelago of glasses? You've got to be kidding me. They say, no, that's how things strike me. I don't have any principles. That's just how things strike me. I feel all I can do with you is try, try various therapy tactics. You know. And there are these, there's this grand thing that Coleman talks about, arbitrariness arguments in metaphysics. I feel the third thing is part of what's going on under that heading. But it's an arbitrariness argument in the, in the way that, you know, if someone came to me and said, uh, I think, you know, spaghetti bolognese is great, but penne bolognese, penne bolognese, terrible. I think, I might say, well, that's pretty arbitrary, <laughs> you know. I basically think they're weird. It's not like I've got some grand argument, the arbitrariness argument. I would say that when I say that's arbitrary, that's just a way of giving voice to the fact that I think they're weirdos. And I think the conservative is a weirdo in metaphysics just as that particular pattern of tastes in gastronomy, uh, pasta gastronomy, is, is, is weird. I, I don't have some master argument they just strike me as weird. And you can ease, I can get you into the frame of mind of what it might be like for those guys to strike me as weird, and that's really what I'm trying to do. Let me... I've got till... Oh, quarter two. Quarter two. Yeah. 
Let me give you a few exercises in therapy uh, where there's an object that the adder believes in that looks crazy. But, you know, I do something like the, uh, the spectacle therapy to make it not look that crazy. Um, so, some metaphysicians, adders, have talked about these things outcars. And I want to give you a feel for what an outcar is. An outcar, uh, when, when I'm, my car's in the garage, no outcar yet. As my car leaves the garage, as the more and more it protrudes, an outcar comes into existence and it grows and grows and grows. When my car is halfway out the garage, the outcar is, has the shape of the front half of my car. By the time my car's out of the garage, the uh, outcar has exactly the shape of my car. My car hasn't grown, but an outcar came into existence and grew and grew and grew till it was the shape of a car. It started off, early on it had the shape of a kind of bumper, the front, uh, the front uh, perimeter of my car, as it were, but it grew and grew and grew into the shape of a car. And of course, the, the, uh, the conservative will typically, well, that's ridiculous that there are these things out cars. What, you're the crazy one. I don't, you're the one that needs therapy if you believe in out cars. But, I mean, here's uh, a thought exercise. And, to be fair, Corman has a lot to say about it, and I can't really go through all the details of what he has to say. Um, here's another thing. Uh, I'll call it an outrock. So suppose there's a big rock underneath the ocean, and then it starts to protrude out of the ocean, and the, the rock doesn't change uh, shape, but the, the outrock grows and grows and grows, and the outrock, the contours of the outrock are uh, given by the shape of the part of the um, rock that protrudes above the sea. Now, I think when you think about it, it wouldn't be nearly that strange to believe in outrocks. I mean, you could imagine, and maybe we even do this, the Newfoundlers Newfoundlanders come along and they call those things islands. Oh, there's an island. And I think an island is kind of an outrock, you see. <laughs> an island is the part of a rock that uh, it protrudes above the ocean. And the, as, as it protrudes more, you might think that the island grows. And even if you think ordinary common sense doesn't quite think of it that way, it doesn't seem anything like much of a stretch to believe in those things, islands, as I just uh, described them. That doesn't seem that weird. And then once you're into outrocks, i.e. islands under the conception that I just gave you, it doesn't seem, it seems a bit weird to believe in outrocks, but not, i.e. islands, but not outcasts. I mean, why outrocks, but not uh, outcasts? And so, once you get a bit of an entering wedge through the outrocks, the uh, outcars don't seem that weird at all. Um, I'll just say, talk about one complaint that Corman makes against some of the extraordinary objects uh, is that he says, some of these extraordinary objects seem to pop in and out of existence without any of the underlying matter, change, without any intrinsic change in the underlying matter. But I think that's true of all sorts of ordinary objects of common sense. I mean, when I sign a treaty, a country might go, when some leaders sign a treaty, a country might go out of existence. The underlying matter doesn't. When someone signs certain legal contracts, uh, legal documents, a restaurant might go out of existence. That doesn't mean that the underlying matter goes out of existence. When Michelangelo chips away at uh, a block of marble to reveal the stat to bring the statue of David into existence, it's not like that lump of marble that is the statue of David underwent any internal change. Rather, I just, uh, Michelangelo knocked little bits of it away. So if the complaint is, oh, and 
In terms of principled complaints, the main, <coughs> one of the main lines Corman runs is this, but it's not a principled complaint he's entitled to because this sort of phenomenon of going in and out of existence without un any underlying internal change in the matter uh, is something that occurs to myriad objects of common sense. <coughs> One other thought experiment. Um, you know, it's, if I take a steel rod and a steel ball, Let's suppose that common sense doesn't ordinarily countenance a thing built out of that rod and that ball. But if I draw something like that with my pen and then draw a dot at the top, as it were, so there's a dot shape and then a line shape, common sense does countenance a thing that I've brought into being there, namely the letter I, a particular token of the letter I, not the letter, but the, that particular token of the letter, that particular example of the letter I. But if you look at that letter I and you look at the, the ball and then a gap and then the steel rod, it looks like, well, one's made of ink and one's made of steel, but it doesn't look like there's a heck of a lot of a difference between the, 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 uh, the, the letter I and the, and the, and the case of the... Uh, steel rod and the ball. And so if, if you're to allow that the uh, stick of ink and the ball of ink make up an object, I maybe in that maybe a particular letter, maybe many objects, there's a lot of feels like there's a lot of pressure on you to uh, believe in uh, an object made up out of the steel ball and the steel rod. I mean there's not that much difference between ink and steel, it seems, when it comes to uh, metaphysics. Uh, in connection to this, uh, and I think this is a typical conservative move, um, Corman and other conservatives lean hard on the idea that creative intentions make all the difference. Their picture is, oh, in the case of the, 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 the stick of ink and the ball of ink, it's not the ink versus steel that matters. After all, if I was a giant, I could draw, I could write in, in steel rather than ink, uh, maybe. Or, or maybe if the, if, the, if the bits of steel were small enough, maybe I could, I could do it uh, right, right now. Um, but the picture is, oh, it's your intention to bring into being the letter I that made it that the letter I came into being. But in the case of the stick, of um, the stick of um, the stick of steel and the ball of steel, there was no analogous creative intention, um, and this is the other kind of principle that figures prominently: something connecting existence to creative intentions. It says there are these things artifacts, and you need creative intentions to bring them into being, and that can do a lot of the work of explaining. Uh, why we let in some conservative things, the things of conservatism, but not things that look, as it were, superficially, uh, candidates that look superficially similar. Um, I think this is a case where if you start bearing down on the details, and this is often, often things sound good when you first hear them, and when you start really bearing down on details, it starts to get tricky. Um, just a few thoughts there. I mean, what is, remember, I mean, when I write a letter I, sometimes that's an accident. I intended to write the letter L, and for some reason it's like, uh, you know, this is a phenomenon that happens. I say a word I didn't intend to say. I write a, word, a letter I didn't intend to write. It's not like then, oh, no, you didn't write an I then because you didn't intend to. I mean, that would be really wacky to think you only write the letter I when you intended to. We often say things we don't intend. We often write things we don't intend. That's bad luck. So this idea that there's some straightforward correlation between what comes into being and what you intend to bring into being in the case of artifacts really doesn't uh, hold up. Just and another little thought experiment there. I mean, think of two Neanderthal, com kind of Neanderthal communities. You know, I've seen these kind of 
primitive axes where you sort of chip away at a piece of stone to make it kind of sharp at the edge. Um, imagine one of the Neanderthal communities thinks of this, I'm going to make myself an axe and I'm going to do it by chipping away. You know, the other community doesn't particularly think that way. They think, you know what, if I make this, if I chip away at this stone so it's sharp there, then I'll be able to, like, do some stuff. They don't, they don't have, the one community doesn't have an intention about axes. They just have an intention to uh, refashion the stone. I think it's, again, I mean, you can, you can hang tough. I think it's very weird to think, oh, well, the one community brings into existence a certain thing, an axe. But the other thing, the other community just makes a sharp piece of rock but they never bring an axe into being. I mean, I find that very, very odd. Uh, but I also find it very challenging to see how to work out this intending makes it so in the case of artifacts that, it, uh, that evades these concerns when you actually try to work out the details. So I've been uh, singing the praises. I've got a long left, Not 10 minutes. I'm gonna switch gears. Uh, there's a lot I had to say about Corman, but I spent so much time setting things up that I haven't really had time to say that much. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to switch gears a bit and say a little bit about what worries me more um, about adding, the kind of adding I like, where I have a vision of an extravagant metaphysics that's underwritten by nice, clean, general principles. Like whenever you've got some things, there's a further thing that they compose. Or, for those of you that are kind of clued into modal metaphysics a bit more, for any, for any path through modal space or filled space-time, there's an object that, uh, that follows that path, maybe more carefully, from any function from uh, possible realities to filled regions of space-time, there's an object whose possible, whose profile corresponds to that function. You know, these are really nice general principles about the structure of the objects in reality that yields a, an extravagant ontology but uh, uh, delivers common sense and rounds it out in a way that's uh, potentially extremely satisfying and in the way that mathematics and mathematical physics are very sa sa satisfying. So the thing that worries me most in this area are uh, very abstract concerns where um, certain lessons and ideas from logic and mathematics seem to put pressure on the principles that I've uh, just uh, begun to articulate. Um, let me give you a little bit of a feel of this. Um, Mathematics tends to theorize about numbers using, using sets. Uh, there are uh, sets are kind of like collections, but you know, there's a little bit more discipline to it. For those. So there's a set of myself and you, there's a set of myself and you and you. One set has two members, one set has three members. There's the set of all the uh, natural numbers, with numbers one, two, three, four, five, and so on. That's a set with infinitely many members. And then one of the lessons of, uh, one of the great discoveries, fantastic discoveries of modern mathematics is that there are yet larger sets than the set of infinite numbers. Um, the set of, uh, of, real, of real numbers that you can think of as being represented by a decimal point and then an uh, infinitary expansion of of numerals, the set of those guys is even greater than uh, the set of uh, natural numbers. And there's a whole hierarchy of sets of greater and greater infinities. Another incredible discovery that was helped along by philosophy is you can't think of there being a, there are some pluralities that are too great to form a set. Um, for example, uh, the set, there isn't a set of all sets. If you take all the sets, you can't think of those uh, as forming a set or you get into all sorts of trouble. 
Uh, there's another idea in set theory, the axiom of replacement, that says if one plurality forms a set and it can be mapped to another plurality, then that forms a set too. If you buy the axiom of replacement, you'll think not only can not, uh, can, can, can't it be that all the sets form a set, but if you somehow had as many angels as there are sets, then they couldn't form a set either. Because if they did, then since they're, if they're, they could be mapped to the sets by the axiom of replacement, the, all the sets would form a set, which we can't allow. So you get these... The, these aren't ordinary, ordinary natural thoughts of common sense, but part of the greatest insights of, of modern mathematics are articulated through the set hierarchy and its structure and shape. So we have a certain size that's, as it were, too big to form a set. It's the, the size, of, size of all the sets. Let's call those big size. That's a big size. It's a size that, uh, you know, part of the person that was responsible for this kind of, uh, this kind of transfinite mathematics was uh, George Cantor, who labeled this size uh, the absolute infinite, where, you know, by comparison, the natural numbers, that's unbelievably boring infinite compared to the absolute infinite. Um, and he regarded the absolute infinite with uh, almost religious reverence. Let me give you another idea from modern mathematics, a little more controversial, but is apparently extremely well motivated. Uh, a, a principle called the limitation of size principle of von Neumann. Uh, the limitation of size principle uh, says, as it were, there's only one big size. If you're too many to form a set, then you're as numerous, th th if a plurality is too many to form a set, then it's as numerous as, the, as all the things. There aren't two big sizes, there's just one, the absolute infinite, we can call it following Cantor. So these are well-motivated, very respectable ideas from, the, from, uh, from modern mathematics, but in surprising ways. Um, these ideas put pressure on very natural ways of rounding out, um, rounding out uh, ontology in the ways that I was envisioning. Okay, and let me give you a couple examples of this. And things get quite dizzying when you look at the interface between foundational ontology and the and cutting edge transfinite mathematics and. It, as it were, but these are things that are forced on us uh, in, a, in, in a certain way, things that we have to confront. This is all very sketchy. Suppose we somehow convinced ourselves that the, that there were, the number of possible realities was big. There are, there are a big number of ways that the world can be. Uh, and I could motivate that, but I haven't got time. If you want me to, I'll try and motivate it. Suppose we have the idea that I like that for every possible path uh, through, uh, through modal, modal th th through, through, through possible space, there's an object with that path. If, if I make that precise, uh, then there's a very compelling argument to the effect that there'll have to be yet more objects right here. Than, than there are big. And why? Because there's this other, other, interesting observa other interesting kind of proof that drives modern mathematics that says, in perfect generality, for any plurality, there are more subpluralities that's greater than one, there are more subpluralities of that plurality than there are elements of that plurality. That means if there are a big number of possible worlds, there are more subpluralities of possible worlds than there are possible worlds. If for any subplurality there's a guy here that inhabits this world and just those, as it were, you'll start to get to a, a, a picture according, you're forced to a picture according to which there are more than big individuals here right now. But that would then violate the limitation of size principle that says there's nothing bigger than big. There's only one size that's bigger than set size. 
And that's the absolute infinite that Cantor spoke about. So that's a, that's a sketch of an argument, but it scares me much more than sort of, you know, uh, conservative intuition pumps. There are these really attractive general principles, but when I bring them side by side with the very general and attractive principles that are much better established uh, from modern mathematics, suddenly tensions crop up and there seems to be, it puts pressure on uh, natural ways of rounding out ontology in a natural and elegant way. One last example. I mean, I'll just mention another paper. Suppose I think in perfect generality, whenever there are some things, there's a thing that is composed of those things. If I think that, then I would think, well, that should have, if it's true in perfect generality, it should apply to sets too. So I'd be led to think that for any plurality of sets, there's a thing composed of those sets. I'm not going to go through the details. There's a very good paper by uh, Gabriella Schiano, my colleague on this. With, with some very plausible principles, you'll get into trouble with limitation of size again. Basically, if for, uh, if for any two different pluralities of sets, there's two different things that they compose and there's more subpluralities of sets than there are sets, and there's an absolute infinity of sets, then this kind of principle will uh, put enormous pressure on you to posit more than one size that's bigger than set size in uh, opposition to the idea of the great mathematician uh, von, Neumann, von, von Neumann, the principle that I call limitation of size. So for me, the, this is the end of things that I find intriguing. I find it quite easy to uh, resist the intuition pumps and uh, declarations of absurdity from the conservatives. I feel I can do therapy on most of them, and even if some are just intransigent and reluctant, I can, uh, the therapy that I do will uh, dissuade uh, fence sitters from joining their ranks. But when it comes to the interface of the fundamental principles of ontology with, um, um, with, with, with transfinite ma mathematics and, uh, and logic and so on, I find, I think, uh, there's a lot that's exciting to be learned but some of our initial instincts about what the simple general principles are might uh, run into trouble. I'm going to stop. Thanks. Thank you.